welcome back to Psychiatry XR. I'm your host, Jessica Hagen, and we are thrilled to welcome Aaron Orr, CEO and founder of Extended Reality Platform XR Health. Aaron, it's great to have you. Thanks for having me. So to give our listeners a bit of background about you and the company, you founded XR Health after seeing the power of XR after a long rehabilitation process, right? That was a personal process for you. And then the company has since grown to be quite dominant in the XR space. So tell us a bit about XR for our listeners who may not know a lot about it. So maybe I'll start by introducing myself briefly. I'm not originally from the healthcare scene. I'm a former F-16 pilot, and I was diagnosed as suffering from whiplash injury due to the active flight and the G-forces. And then the idea came about to combine the virtual reality in rehab. The first application was specific for neck injuries and whiplash. But then we understood that the power of this technology is by far greater than what we anticipated. And today we have over 150 different types of applications for a variety of use cases in physical therapy, occupational therapy, and mental health. We completed over half a million VR treatments. We have two different types of business models. One is we are selling the technology to hospitals and rehab centers and clinics. But the second business model, which I think is very unique in the market, is that we also have our own clinics, virtual reality clinics, where we are treating patients remotely using virtual reality, where we are shipping headsets back home and treating them in virtual reality. That's basically it in a nutshell. So where are some of those clinics located? So it's all virtual. We have operational virtual clinics in the U.S., in all the big states. It's per state in the U.S. because everything is regulated on a state level. And we also have a clinic in Australia where most of those patients there are ASD patients with amazing results. We are now about to launch a clinic in Israel, and we will probably launch a clinic in Europe, probably in Spain next year. Yeah, XR Health has had quite a year so far. I mean, you've had a lot of announcements that have been pretty amazing. You actually announced in April that you were merging with Amelia, right? And I know that Kim, Dr. Bullock, has spoken a lot about her use of Amelia in practice at Stanford. And so what has been the benefit of that merger on your end? How did that kind of elevate your offerings? So one of the things that we realized is that the power of this technology is not just in a single use. And it's a combination of two things. First, is the, then the power of the technology is the combination of different types of environments where the clinician can operate the VR as a tool and basically decide what type of environments and activities and exposures based on what the patient actually needs. And some, you know, I think especially in the Western world, at some point we forgot that any injury or disease, you're not just treating the symptom or you're not just treating that specific part of your body. And I think VR on that front can provide the full holistic picture. Then you can treat chronic conditions in a very holistic way. And the second thing that convinced us to do and and merge the two companies, I think both companies decided to put the clinician in the center of the technology. From the get-go, we decided to take a different approach. We thought that the digital therapeutic concept of giving someone software and hope that would work by itself as a drug, we believe that's a very challenging goal because we still believe that the clinician is a crucial role in the healing process. Absolutely. And both companies designed the products with that in mind. And we had a lot of experience on the physical therapy and occupational therapy. Emilio had a lot of experience on the mental health side. So it made sense for both companies to offer a holistic VR therapeutic platform with a clinician in the center and have the clinician the ability to offer a full range of applications and then leverage to the full extent the power of this technology. Right. And we are seeing benefits of that decision like on a daily basis and any type of activity that we're doing now. The last episode that we did was uh, with Dr. Howard Gurr and uh, Dr. Gurr and Kim started talking about Amelia's previous application of homework or, you know, the ability for physicians to be able to give homework. Is that coming back? It's not just coming back. We are actually amplifying everything regarding homework. Oh, 
Kim is going to be very happy about that. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that we are realizing now, and we are asking ourselves on a daily basis, how can we leverage the technology to treat more patients and leverage the capabilities of a clinician to enable treatment, even though they are not in real time with the patient? Right. It's also true, by the way, for physical therapy and occupational therapy, but in mental health, I think it's even more profound than, than the physical rehab. We need to find a way to still have the patient move forward in their treatment without the clinician in real time doing something. And when you look at the different technologies in the market today, I don't think there's any technology besides virtual reality for mental health that can allow that and enable that type of process. Now, if we can combine and harness the VR technology to reduce burden from clinicians, especially again, mental health clinicians, but still have the same impact and still have patient progressing, we can change dramatically how the market is operating today and enable more patient to get treatment. Because today, worldwide, doesn't matter if it's in the US or in Europe or in Australia, you don't have enough clinicians. You just don't have enough. There's not. And it's very transactional. Like Mm -hmm. the reason that mental health treatment is very, very expensive or very transactional all goes back to supply demand problem. And we believe our technology can solve that. And that's what we are trying to do now. And that's why I'm saying it's starting with the homework of Amelia. We had something similar in extra health of a treatment plan. And we are planning next year to come up with something very, very meaningful that we believe will enable our goal is to get to at least 100x of capacity of a clinician if we'll be able to do that on the technology side. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, there's definitely this supply and demand issue that's going on within mental health, as you talked about. So I love the fact that you're saying we need to concentrate on the clinician, but let's also give patients this tool to be able to continue to improve while they're at home, which in turn does help the clinician, right? So the way that we are looking at that and what I'm telling my clinicians is my job or our job is to turn them into super clinicians. That's our job. Now, the way to do that is not just give a tool for a patient to do homework. The question is, can we provide treatment and have the patient do what they are supposed to do, but have the clinician, instead of just doing real-time activity, take a seat of, I'm monitoring what I recommended the patient to do. I'm monitoring him or her if they're actually making progress as I'm expecting them to do. And then I can intervene only when I'm needed. If the technology is doing their job and I'm monitoring the things that are progressing, maybe I can spend more time with other patients that are not progressing. And on the patient side, can we create an experience that they will feel it's close enough like my clinician is real time with me? And there are different types of techniques and different types of tools, but that's basically what we're trying to do here. And again, I think we are making a lot of progress, and I believe that in a few months we'll be able to present something that will be very exciting to the market. And to circle back a little bit about that, XR Health was awarded a patent for your learning system technology that adjusts training and treatment protocols according to a patient's biometric and motion data, right? So how does that technology work, and what is it useful for, as you just mentioned, giving clinicians more insight? But what else is it useful for? How does it help psychiatrists in particular? So... We now have 24, by the way, patents of different types of... Oh, so not just one. <laughs> that specific patent that you're referring to was the first one that I submitted back in 2016. And the idea was before the Apple Watch and before the biometrics, but the general idea was, can we measure stress, anxiety, pain by using different types of biometric devices like a galvanic skin response, heart rate variability, EEG. And can we adjust the treatment in real time based on your metrics and create a closed loop system where you can actually self-regulate yourself, but not just as an experience, but as a therapeutic tool. And then also have the clinician the ability to adjust that type of engagement. And I think one of the very interesting things that we are seeing with VR is 
we have the ability to hijack the brain to treat the body. And it's a very, very powerful tool. And if we can harness that type of very powerful experience, but also fine tune it to the specific needs of the specific patient, I think we can reduce the amount of different types of narcotics that we are using today, especially in the psychiatric world, but still get the same impact of those narcotics. Now, like other narcotics or drugs, and again, the psychiatrist is the one deciding which type of drug to prescribe and doses and when. Right, absolutely. The question is, can we provide the psychiatrist or the mental health counselors or the same ability like they're prescribing the specific mm-hmm. drug and get the same impact using those types of technologies with far less side effects? So again, it's a process, but I think the technology is getting there. I think we're seeing more and more clinicians open to the idea of and understand how impactful that could be. Your podcast, by the way, is an example of how and what we should do in order to market those devices and those types of technologies are out there. The technology, when initially announced, was said to be able to be combined with the Apple Watch, with Apple's new augmented reality, the Vision Pro headset, to provide this closed-loop AI-enabled treatment. The Vision Pro looks like a pretty amazing headset. I mean, it looks fantastic. It is quite expensive for the average user, right? And even for some clinicians. So who is the intended user for this offering? There will be a full spectrum of devices in the market. And Apple has always liked to take the premium side of the aisle. And our goal is to have technologies that is compatible with all the different types of headsets in the market. And the clinicians will need to decide whatever is suitable for them and each clinician will make their own decisions. I think an interesting thing that the new technology not just the biofeedback, but the entire different types of things that Apple announced and other companies are announcing is the ability to do it also remote and back home with the same impact like you are in person. And I think that's what we'll see in the coming years that instead of doing a 2D type of interview now, or if I'm taking it to the therapeutic side, I believe it will be far more effective in a 3D type of environment as long as I will feel and the patient will feel that we are in the same room. And then you can add different types of components that would make a big impact. And you can add biometrics feedback. And all of that suddenly opens a whole new set of possibilities for treatment. And again, improve access to care. Hopefully will reduce the burden from clinicians because now you can serve a lot more people. But I do think that Like any other uh, technologies out there, there will be the more expensive one that will enable you to do more stuff. And there will be more the cheaper ones. Even today, we have people that are still using the Google Cardboard versions that Amelia created back in 2013, because that's what they believe is the right thing for them and their patients. And we have clinicians and hospitals buying the newest headset that just came out a week ago, right? So it's like, I think you'll always have that spectrum. And our job is to try to support that spectrum as much as possible to enable all clinicians and all patients that want to use the technology to improve their health, to use whatever they want. As the technology progresses, I kind of see how AI would be really useful in creating virtual environments that can just be made on the fly, right? Is that something that you at XR Health have thought about or are exploring or? Of course. And I think one of the things that Without a doubt will happen. The only question is when. Think about how powerful it will be when a psychiatrist or again, a mental health counselor or a social worker or a psychologist, doesn't really matter. They want to create an experience because they believe the experience is what will help the patient or trigger an event in order for them to start the conversation and the treatment. We are seeing that, by the way, around PTSD a lot, right? And when you want to do exposure therapy for that matter, how do you actually create that? And if we can do that and provide the clinicians basically endless amount of environments and anything that they want, they just speak their mind and that's it. That just happens. Right. It just occurs. (laughs) Right. That opens endless amount of possibilities to this industry. Right. But I think VR for mental health and 
emerging AI capabilities and the new headsets will be very, very important for the industry. Absolutely. I agree with you. I think it's going to be really, really valuable. And the more adoption that occurs within the mental health community, I think the more that you will see how valuable it really could be. I think a lot of times right now, providers are really hesitant to adopt the technology first because some of them just don't understand it, you know, and then some of them think that it would be really difficult to actually implement it into their practice. When you come across providers who are hesitant about implementing it, what do you tell them? First of all, we need to do a better job. Us as a company and us as an industry, we need to do a better job to enable them to use the technology in an easy to digest way. We just announced that we launched a few weeks ago a package where the goal of that product was less than 10 seconds for a clinician to get the patient inside virtual reality. Oh, valuable. So valuable. And that's how we structured that package. We basically stripped out all the complexity. No Wi-Fi, even connectivity, like very, very simple. Wow. 13 different types of applications that are mainly stress, anxiety, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, some more like 50-ish different type of 360 environment. And not because it's a full therapeutic tool with all the capabilities. It's probably 5% of our capabilities on the technology side. But it enables the patient and the clinician to step into virtual reality very easily, right, with no friction. And what we're seeing now is that after they are seeing the value of the technology in an easy-to-digest way, now they are willing to take it to the next level and hear about Okay, how can we treat? What other things can we do with this technology? I think us as a company, we thought that features and options will create value. And what we actually saw, it created friction and increased the problem for adoption. So that's on our side. And I think we are getting to a better place there. And I think we need to also keep communicating and publish papers and get patient feedback out there and show more and more clinician success stories. And I see that now more and more. I think now we have over 50 clinical trials combined, both Amelia and Extra Health, and over half a million via treatments. We have patients from the age of 8 to 93, both on-site and back home. And I think we have enough data to get into a conversation both clinically and usability and workflows and reimbursement. I think now we are getting to a point that we can have fruitful conversations. And usually when I'm getting pushback about the technology, I usually solve it by saying, you know what, just try. Just try it. Yeah. Just try it. And let's talk in a month. Yeah. That's smart that you kind of, you made a teaser to kind of get people, well, try it out and see what you think about it. Yeah, I can tell you that now that I'm leaning more to mental health, I found, for example, again, we're now investing a lot in PTSD and how we can, you know, adjust our platform for PTSD and as a PTSD specific package. And I wasn't familiar with the EMDR technique at all. If you're not coming from a mental health background, Mm -hmm. I never heard about that before. And the first time someone told me about EMDR, I was like, what? What? (laughs) What? (laughs) And I realized that I have no doubt that at the beginning, you know, when people try to implement DMDR, I have no doubt that a lot of people say that this would never work. This would never work. Doesn't make sense. It looks right, like. Right. But, you know, over time, when you ask clinician today, what's one of the best ways to treat trauma? EMDR is like, that's the common practice today, right? It's like no one is debating anymore whether this <laughs> is. But I have no doubt that when it started, you know, that wasn't the case, right? Right. It took a long time to convince clinicians that eye movement have any type of relationship to how you process trauma. I think that we'll see the same type of pattern in VR. Just the difference is that possibilities in VR and using this technology is by far greater. But on the educational component, I think it's roughly the same process that we'll see. Right. And you, XR Health, recently announced that you are sending a VR headset into space alongside HTC Vive and Nord Space apps. And you're actually creating a headset that can be used in microgravity conditions, right? 
Can you tell us a little bit about this? And this is for the benefit of astronauts' mental health. So first of all, I'm by the time that we are recording this, it's already in space. It's already in space. <laughs> and more than that, we got a message that it's working. Oh, fantastic. Three days ago. And it was a long process, two and a half years of development. The main challenge there was to make sure that the headset is working in a zero right. gravity environment. For the audience that haven't tried via, it's a 360 and it's all centered based on, you know, your positioning and in space, you know, it is what it is. Positioning can change. Yeah. And that's the big challenge. And I think HTC did an amazing job of figuring out how to utilize that. And on the mental health side, to be four to six months in a very close environment with the same people, you know, far away from home, and you need to be in high performance all the time. So the idea is that can we allow the astronauts to have some time for themselves and this connects from the current environment in order to enable them to actually keep the high performance. One of my clinicians gave me an example, which I, I like to iterate here that, and I wasn't thinking about that before getting into the mental health space is that when you're running for a long period of time, or if you are doing exercise for a long period of time, if you won't give yourself time to recover, you will get injured. Right. It is what it is. Very easy to understand when you're doing those types of activities. Mental health is the same. If you are in a high performance type of environment, high stress for a long period of time, you will get injured. It just reflects in a different way on your body and on your mind. And the astronauts' use case is exactly that, right? They need to perform every day. Their schedule is measured by the minute for six months. They know exactly what they're doing every single minute. They have a lot of high stressful situations and, and tasks that they need to do. And the VR allows them, at least in the current design that we did, just to zone out under, again, the same concept that it will give them time to regroup, to recover and make sure they're maintaining their high performance. And I have no doubt that this is an example that if it will be successful, it will be obviously very relevant on Earth for a lot of use cases. Right. And I believe that in the next decade, we'll see more and more of those headsets and more and more of those missions, especially now that we are about to start flying is humanity. Right. You know, at some point we will fly to Mars, which is two years and not four months. Mm -hmm. So all of those things will become far more difficult and more extreme. And I think VR will be a very important tool in order to make sure that you know, the people that are doing those tasks are you know, still at the top of their game, even though the environment and, uh, and everything is relatively intense. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to having you on again at a later date when you have more announcements that you would like to make. <laughs> We are now in a, doing an announcement every couple of weeks, so you just need to pick. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so maybe a little bit farther out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me. Do you have anything else that you want to add for our listeners? Keep doing the amazing job that you're doing. Let's you know, work together to spread the word of how this technology can help clinicians and patients. And again, I believe that we can change the industry and, and take the entire industry forward by start implementing this technology in greater scale. I agree. I think this technology is definitely going to change a lot in mental health care. Thank you again for joining me. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode of Psychiatry XR. We hope you gained a new perspective on using extended reality in healthcare. And thank you for listening. This episode was brought to you by Psychiatry XR, the psychiatry podcast about immersive technology and mental health. For more information about Psychiatry XR, visit our website at psychiatryxr.com. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and tune in again next month to hear from another guest about XR use and psychiatric care. You can join us monthly on Apple Podcasts, Twitter, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Psychiatry XR was produced by Kim Bullock, Faiza Arshad, and myself, Jessica Hagen. Please note this podcast is distinct from Dr. Bullock's clinical teaching and research roles at Stanford University. The information provided is not medical advice and should not be considered or taken as a replacement for medical advice. This episode was edited by David Bell and music and audio was produced by Austin Hagen. See you next time.